you're not able to engage with and love what you're doing as an artist, like that means you're bored and it's time to make something new. Hello, print friends, and welcome to the 94th episode of Pine Copper Lime, the internet's number one printmaking podcast. I'm your host, Miranda Metcalf. I release weekly podcasts with people in the print world who are doing something a bit beyond the expected. So please subscribe on your podcast listening app of choice. You can also find Pine Copper Lime on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and you can find links to all of this at pinecopperlime.com. We also have a Patreon page where generous, talented, and beautiful supporters sign up at tiers that start at just a dollar a month, and that really helps us to keep bringing you printmaking content every week. You can also get thank yous like stickers, prints, and mugs. You also get bonus content. Shop Talk with our editor, Timothy Pauschak. These are quick and dirty tips and tricks from our guests from materials, processes, business advice, and just general studio nonsense. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, check out a link in the show notes to hear Tim's chat with today's guest. Printmaking forever, shun the non-believers. Pine Copper Lime is brought to you by Speedball Art Products, who've been offering a diverse range of high-quality products to your creative practice since 1997. Products like Arnheim 1619, a high-quality, low-cost paper made in collaboration with a historic paper mill near the city of Arnheim. Our editor, Timothy Pauschak, swears by it for printing lithographs. And our friend and guest of early episode number four, Miles Calvert, evangelizes its use yearly, encouraging his students to participate in Speedball's New Impressions contest, where they produce work in every print medium. So if you're looking for an affordable paper that can support whatever inky ideas you want to throw at it, then head on over to speedballart.com to find out where you can pick up the start of your next edition. There's a link in the show notes. My guest this week is Alexander Landerman, a graphic designer and letterpress technician at the University of Indiana, Bloomington. We talk about growing up in a rural home with a family tradition of hunting and trapping, fixing things resulting in a deep personal connections to objects, trade school, being aware of where your food comes from, and using your skills to support what you care about, even if they don't line up in the conventional way. So, without further ado, sit back, relax, and prepare to ratchet on a press with Alexander Landerman. Hi, Alex. How's it going? Hey, I'm doing really well. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, I am super excited to host you. I first really came across your work, well, you're one of the first artists that I actually saw on Instagram. Oh, wow. Yeah, like back when it was like, oh, this Instagram thing, like, I don't know, maybe there's some artists who are putting their work up. <laughs> like, what a what a strange and interesting idea. Who would have thought? And I've really been following your work since then. Um, I think that anyone who listens to the podcast with any kind of regularity probably is not at all surprised to know that I am quite an animal person, very much an animal person. And that, of course, relates to your work as well. So I'm really looking forward to having a conversation about the way all of those intersect. But before we do that, could you please let people know who you are, where you are, and how it is that you would go about describing what it is that you do? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm Alexander Landerman. I'm a letterpress printer, illustrator, and educator. Um, I live in Bloomington, Indiana, which is the southern part of Indiana, and I work at Indiana University teaching letterpress and graphic design. Beautiful. Well, and so where did you grow up and where was art in that part of your life? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, (laughs) like the most loaded question, right? Um, yeah. So tell us all the things right now. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Everything at once as fast as possible. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's how we do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I grew up in rural Wisconsin, like right, right in the middle of Wisconsin on the outskirts of a like medium, small town. And, uh, yeah, just, uh, extremely fortunate animals were always sort of at the center of my upbringing, animals and nature in general. 
my dad has uh, always done a lot of fur trapping, which looking at my work and, and maybe knowing a little bit more, coming to know a little bit more about my work might seem a little strange, but um, it was really interesting because our lives were always really tied to the land that we were occupying or using, I guess. Uh, so there was always a garden, there was always hunting, there was always trapping, there was always animals. And that just like, as a child living rurally, just sort of evolved into a fascination with making things. And, you know, you have a lot of time alone, I guess, uh, which leads to a a lot of time being a weird, creative little kid. (laughs) That's interesting, that connection between that rural living, the the country living, however you want to put it, and that being constantly occupied with doing and with working with your hands and just kind of that business of staying alive and making life work and the the movement and the labor that goes into it, I could see that translating actually really in quite interesting ways to the life of the artist and the ways in which artists kind of need to be constantly moving forward with using their hands to do so, making things. Absolutely. And just like it, it, it turns into the, you know, there's the barrier of having to drive somewhere to go purchase something when you could ultimately maybe repair it or, you know, uh, reuse something that you already had, which sort of connects you a little bit more deeply to being somebody who's physically making or involved with objects. And I think that that translates really beautifully into art making as you, as you like age, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. And I think also just having a part of your brain that's always looking first to creating something rather than purchasing it. You know, some people will will look at a dress or they'll look at anything that they want or need and they'll say, I could just dry and dye an existing dress that I have that color. I don't need to go to H&M to get that color of dress. Or they'll say, oh, I don't need... Uh, to go buy a new desk, I saw a desk with three legs um, behind a department store, and I know how to put a fourth leg on it. And I think that in some ways, once you start thinking that way, or if you were raised to sort of think that way, it can really inform the way you interact with life and sort of the business of getting your needs met in a really fundamental way. Yeah, and it's just such a lovely of approach to things because I, I'm pretty nostalgic. I'm, I get, I'm, I like romanticize a lot of things and, and sometimes in silly ways, but it, it's kind of nice to be able to take something that's broken or damaged and not only repair it and like, I don't know, save the need for another thing to be made or have something, you know, remain in operation instead of get, getting thrown out, but also you get to form this personal bond to it. Um, so all my favorite objects in my life are things that I've really worked on and, and built myself, you know, whether it's, it, it doesn't matter what it is, but uh, I think I always think about my drafting table, which was found on the side of the road and something that was rebuilt over years, like, you know, made functional and then made beautiful over years. And I, I just love that thing. I don't know how I'd ever part with it unless I moved to somewhere where I just couldn't possibly bring it. Yeah. Um, and I think that all stems back to, to growing up in a place where that was encouraged to kind of fall in love with objects and, and to have like my great, great grandmother's rolling pin is kind of ridiculous, but also it's beautiful and porcelain and an object that like will remain in my life and probably until the day I die. (laughs) Wow. I love that. Yeah. And there's this, reverence that you can have towards objects when you really understand what kind of took to bring them into being, right? So you can have this attachment to a drafting table because you know the history behind it. You know how it came to exist in the world. Whereas if you're in a situation where you're like, oh yeah, I just like put in my credit card numbers and then in a day or two days this drafting table showed up on my front doorstep. I mean, there's no way that that has anything like the same effect on you. Yeah. And and I also will say, like, you know, having moved away from the community I grew up in and getting to kind of curate and choose the objects that have remained in my life, it's super nice to not have a bunch of junk. (laughs) So, you know, I have the things that mean the world to me, but I also like don't have a lot of things, which is, which is really nice and allows me now as, as an adult 
to kind of choose the objects that I bring into my home. So to think carefully about what I buy and what remains. So that way I don't acquire, you know, I don't want to be one of those people who just sits in a house filled with objects that mean nothing to me. So, yeah. So speaking of objects and making, how did you come to printmaking? And then also kind of within that little baby question, why letterpress within the whole family of printmaking? Yeah, I mean, there's like, there are so many answers to this question. And it, it's almost like my mood, uh, <laughs> the way I'll answer it. But I think the most honest one is I, I really like people and connections. And the person who was teaching letterpress in my undergrad formed a really strong connection with me. Um, Karen Heft is their name. They run Arcadian Press, which is a lovely, they, they make books. And she just sort of, she was the only person in my undergrad who would just look at one of my drawings and be like, that one's kind of shitty. And, uh, you know, you get used to maybe a certain level of people enjoying like what you're making, especially if you draw animals and they're representational. Sometimes I, you know, you get a little bit of a pass here and there. And, and she would really call me out when something wasn't working, which I just, I, I instantly gravitated towards because I felt like that honesty really changed things for me. And because she was a letterpress artist and I really, I've always struggled academically and especially uh, with language. Like I, I think I have a strong like bodily kinesthetic intelligence, but mathematical and linguistic intelligence, like those standard IQ test intelligence has always been really difficult for me. So she recognized that I had some facility for working with my hands and also that I needed a good mentor and reached out, which brought me into letterpress. So I started by working in her shop and helping her like kind of on the weekends. And then I, I spent a summer sort of pseudo apprenticing intern thing with her. And she kind of taught me the basics of graphic design as well as, but through the eye of letterpress. So I actually didn't really take any printmaking in my undergraduate. It was just all all letterpress and, and uh, 2D sort of drawing and painting kind of things. And then when I got to grad school, I actually applied at Indiana University, which is where I'm teaching now, and was brought in here. And that's when I both fell in love with printmaking, but also realized my home was always going to, the core of my practice would always be as a printmaker and letterpress. So... Yeah, I think it's really significant what you're saying, and I like to maybe dwell on it for a moment or two. You know, you're saying that you were having some struggles with academia and with the mathematics and linguistic side of things, and yet here you are, or you're at Indiana University, Bloomington, and you're working in academia. And I think it's important for people to hear that, that, that just because you don't necessarily fall into these really narrow ways that sometimes people measure the possibility of academic success does not mean that you can't find your place in academia. You know, because I I get it. Like, I have moderate dyslexia myself. So I did not do super well in the lot of ways that success is measured in public school. So I just think it's so important for people to hear those stories of people who maybe don't hit those benchmarks, but still find their place and still find success. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to pull out my soapbox for just like a second. And, ah, and do really, it. I'm ready. I just want to reiterate everything you just said. And I think you stated it in like a lovely way. But to just further that, like in college, I was actively learning essentially how to read because I was one of those students, you know, I went to a big uh, high school. I was constantly encouraged by my, uh, would they be the counselors um, at that school to join the military because college was not in my future. I struggled a lot. Uh, I think, you know, I graduated with a very low GPA. I went to a a tech school, which was absolutely awesome. Uh, You know, I learned, I learned how to really study and how my brain worked and how I could better remember things. But also at that time, I just spent a lot of time reading and reevaluating kind of how I viewed myself. Cause I, I think that, you know, in my childhood, always being essentially like a bad student, I had developed this idea that like I was not capable of certain things, which wasn't true, but it was the truth that I kind of knew. And 
it was really detrimental. And I see students come through sometimes that lack that confidence, who are just absolutely brilliant as artists. And, you know, I kind of want to like sit them down and be like, hey, like, all those people who told you were dumb, you are dumb, they're actually really dumb. And you're very smart, and you're very capable. And like, I'm here for you, which is, you know, kind of, kind of my mission, I guess, as a as an academic now is to sort of offer a little bit of encouragement to those students who are struggling because it sucks. It sucks feeling stupid. It does. It it really does. And I think, too, what you're saying about how our visions of ourself and the way we see ourselves become self-fulfilling prophecy is really important. Because if you're fed this line, it's like, oh, you're not a college kid, you're a military kid, and you're just a little baby human whose brain is squishy, you're going to take that in, and that's going to become what you think your path is because it's what you've been told. And if you've been told that because just you're not good at geometry, it's so silly. Like there is an infinite amount of humans in the world and ways to show up as a human and the ways intelligence can manifest. And it's like we sit there and we're like, we have one way of measuring it. One, you have to, you have to like measure up to this or you don't get to sit with us. Like you don't get to be in the club. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And like, I mean, and I guess that circles back really nicely to like my undergraduate experience with really strong mentors. And, you know, I mentioned Karen Haft, who was, who was wonderful, but there were so many other really strong mentors in my undergraduate that sort of shaped how I looked at the world. I mean, the liberal arts education that I got was incredible. I think that that really opened up me as a person and my perspectives. And I don't know, I, that's probably why I will remain in academia for as long as I possibly can, because I hope to provide that to students. Not that I always hit that mark, but I think I'm getting better at it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a practice. Definitely. Yes. It's a practice. And I'm, I'm just so thankful. (laughs) Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the mentor, mentee relationship is hugely important. And I know this is something that I'm sure I've talked about on the podcast before, because it's something that I see other places in the world that seems to be not absent, but just definitely not as common in the States. Whereas if you take a place like Thailand, where I live now, it's not just an older printer will hire a younger printer to work in their shop. And it's just like, you're my employee. Don't wipe the plate that way. See you on Monday they really take them on as someone to nurture and to mentor. And so they'll be giving them relationship advice about how to deal with their gallerist, or they'll be giving them advice about showing internationally or aesthetic advice or how to spend their money from their first exhibition. And it creates this structure where people are being supported. And again, this is like outside of an academic setting, But what also happens is those roots run really deep between those two people. And then as soon as a younger printmaker gets their footing underneath them a little bit, they start to look for someone who's even younger, someone who's even greener, and start to mentor them as well. And so you just get this chain of people kind of reaching down with one hand and up with the other and beginning to create a structure of information and and help that really, you know, runs really deeply. Um, and it's, it's really, really neat to see. It's so wonderful. And, and I think it's one of those things that like, for whatever measure of success I've had as an artist, if I were to go back in time and talk to future me and say like, Hey, these are the things you need to do. I don't actually think I would know exactly what to say to that person because you actually need to be there as a mentor, like step-by-step because every decision you make, everything you do, like you need people to talk to. And that's something I get to do for my students is I get to offer them that, I don't know, I get to offer them that time and that space, whether it's just like a moment to say, I'm really struggling with this, or like, why am I even doing this? Like, this is stupid, or whatever. And and then you can kind of look at it and be like, you're not dumb. This isn't dumb. You're just having a bad day. (laughs) And, And that That can be all somebody needs. And we don't really have that playbook. You know, you look into like a more corporate setting where it's like you do these things and you're rewarded for hard work. That's not always the case. You know, just because you put 50 hours into 
this print or this drawing or this painting or sculpture doesn't doesn't mean it's good <laughs> and that can be sometimes hard to tell students the first time it's like i understand you worked it you worked really hard on this but that doesn't mean it's successful so let's make it successful yeah yeah right and to ask that question you know what did we learn from it can be really important, especially when the end result is not what we were hoping for. So just to kind of be like, all right, what happened? Like, walk me through what happened here. Come on. Yeah. And art making is so great for that, too, because, the, you know, it's the, all of your life experiences kind of culminate on in all the work that you're making, which might not always be the case in every job. I mean, I guess to some extent, but it seems like it's really very at the front of art making, which is nice. Yeah, so we've heard how you came to Letterpress and how you came to printmaking more generally, but I'd love to hear about the animals in your work and, you know, yeah, how do they show up there? You spoke of your father who's a hunter and who's a fur trapper, even though that really sounds like something out of the 17th century. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, people use fur and they must get it from somewhere. So yeah. But yeah, out of all the things in the world, um, why animals? Yeah. I mean, so, oh gosh, specifically, I think as a child, that was what was around me. And then when I was in undergraduate and, and starting to figure out like what I wanted to make work about and how I wanted to make work. And it was hard not to see animals and because I was living in this little two room cabin by myself with, well, with my dog. So I, I lived in this tiny cabin by myself and there were just animals everywhere. There was a, a little, uh, dammed up pond full of fish and there was, there were deer and fox and rabbits. And just, those were the things that were part of my daily life. So I would walk outside and I would get to see a crane. So, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't super isolated by any means. Um, but that was the space I was in. So those animals were really characters in my life. And, you know, when you're part of the, um, I guess the food system in a way where, where a lot of the food that you're eating is something that was either grown in a garden that a family member has or hunted by a family member, you can't really separate yourself from what your food is. So from a pretty young age, I kind of realized that eating animals was pretty messed up. So I I stopped eating anything that wasn't, you know, from my family. So I was never really a hunter. I just, I, it, it hurts me too much to cause harm. So as a kid, I just didn't eat meat unless it was something like my father had, had brought home. And then as I got a little bit older, I was like, well, actually, I don't want to eat any of this because, you know, um, I don't know, half being like, you know, a rebellious kid, but mostly just feeling bad because I knew where it came from. So I've always just really been concerned about or concerned with animals because it was so much a part of my life. No, no, I think that it's all very intertwined. And I can imagine growing up with the reality of what meat is and where it comes from and what creatures go through in order for us to eat them you know, that just meant that you didn't ever have to have that moment that a lot of kids have where they connect that package in the freezer at the supermarket to the little baby cow in their storybook that was with you from the beginning. And it's something that people react really differently to or kids react really differently to. Um, You know, I know for me, I was always like, "Uh, are you, are you sure that's the way this works? I mean, I see everybody's doing it, but like, it doesn't like look great <laughs> from my yeah. perspective. What what we're doing and, here, and there are there are so many reasons. You know, I think those childhood experiences are obviously what started that conversation. But there are so many reasons why animals are just more important than they're ever given credit for. But yeah, and, and there were also some moments in my childhood. There was like uh, there was a, a, a gun accident when I was a kid where um, somebody. I was out hunting with a bunch of people, um, with family members and I was very young. So I obviously wasn't hunting, but, uh, one family member got shot by another family member and they were fine, but it obviously like as a child, like you can't really, 
miss that connection that this is like a very brutal and painful and real experience that animals are being subject to continually. So I, I think that like some of those connections were made um, in ways that just couldn't be, I just couldn't, I could never turn it off at this point. Or at least I, I really hope I wouldn't be able to turn it off at this point. But beyond that, you know, you, you keep growing as a human and as an artist and thank goodness for that. Cause my, I would be very bored with this if it didn't continue to evolve. But you know, now it's just, I mean, things are, things are a little bit grim for our animal friends. You know, it's what it's the, the sixth mass extinction, but this one's all, all caused by humans. And we look at the way like indicator species are, are really what they're telling us about the health of our, our forests and our, our world in general. And it's, it's really, it's too bad. So animals will always, animals at this point in my career really, they'll remain in my work because I'm, I'm hoping to be a, a small voice for them. You know, I, I wish I was a scientist and, and and had that facility and could maybe affect more change, but I have a certain set of skills and that's illustration and, and design. And I want to use those skills to, to really be a champion for other, other creatures, not just humans and myself. But it is so important though, that we have people from different vocations trying to get this message out in different ways because it's, you know, some people are going to respond to data and graphs and some people are going to respond to the brilliant field researcher who's up to her ass in mud and being bitten by mosquitoes and counting frogs. And artists need to be there to make the emotional connection with people and, and really get at those things that are kind of beyond graphs and beyond words and, you know, connect with that intuitive side of us because this is the most important thing that we could be talking about right now. You know, climate collapse is real and animals are one of the best indicators of where we are in this. And, we're seeing ecosystems which have evolved for millions and millions of years to be these perfect systems that keeps everything in balance. And now we're playing Jenga with them and each animal that goes extinct or that we radically disrupt their environment or their population, that's a block being removed. And the tower just gets less and less and less stable as we do this. So yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you're doing this work, that you're on our team. Um, because it's something that we need to talk more about and it's something that we're going to have to face within our lifetimes. And it's, yeah, I just, it's the second we stop talking about COVID, this is what we need to talk about. This is going to be the defining issue of, I was going to say our lifetimes, but like, I don't know, humanity, like of the, of the story of humans, I think. I I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I, 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 I definitely don't demean uh, mean to demean myself as an artist. I think that what we do as as artists is incredibly important, and um, I think that I just recognize the holes in my research right now. So um, over the past year, we uh, my partner and I have been doing a lot of foraging, and they they know a lot about plants. I mean, just they they know an incredible amount about plants, and it's really helpful. It's, it's really nice um, because, you know, we go on hikes and we take the dog and that's the only thing we want to be doing. And, and one of the things that I've been talking to them about and just talking about in general is I want to create stronger relationships with scientists because I think that much like these ecosystems and how they depend on each other, I think we need to work to insert ourselves into these conversations, but also work as like a united front so I actually on, on this past Tuesday, I had a meeting with somebody at the National Science Foundation, um, and we've been talking about ways to better incorporate, you know, the kind of work that I'm doing with the kind of work that researching scientists are doing and how I can build those connections, because I'm learning <laughs> and very much a human and very capable of making really big mistakes or, or missing really big parts of these puzzles. And I don't want to. I really want to have an accurate representation. I want to know 
all the things I need to know about, you know, a frog and what it eats and where it lives. So I can illustrate its, its whole or, or a significant portion of its ecosystem. So that way, you know, and, uh, somebody who is a scientist can look at it and get excited at the same time who somebody who's, you know, seven years old can look at it and get really excited. And, and those are the people I'm most interested in, in speaking to is, is a generation of kids or, or people who are ready to listen. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I just, this stuff is so important and, um, it's really hard because there's like, I mean, especially right now, there's so many important conversations having happening, but this is the one that I feel most suited to contribute to because of my experiences and my upbringing. Yeah. I mean, I think it can be overwhelming for mm-hmm. a lot of people when you look at everything that's happening. And we are in the middle of so many important conversations right now and reckonings around race and gender. And it's happening all over the globe. And I think that people can just get flooded and frozen where they think, I can't do everything. You know, I can't think about these social justice issues and climate change, you know, and taking care of my aging parents and my kid. And like, so I just, I just won't do anything. You know, I can't, I can't do everything. So I will do nothing. And I just think it's so vital though, that people know that they don't have to do everything, but doing something is so much better than doing nothing, even if it's not perfect pick something and oh my god forward. yeah well and and also the expectations we place on ourselves like i've been a vegan for a very long time you know and uh, i still like probably once every other year will be hanging out with a group of friends back when we used to do those things and have like a beer or two and then be like i'm gonna eat a piece of pizza and then i get deathly ill from it and totally regret it but like I, I'm going to make those mistakes and, and I allow myself to make mistakes, which all kind of, you know, it all kind of circles back to like allowing yourself to not be an expert, but also working to find people who are so you can have the most informed opinions and, and do the most good. I, I don't know. I definitely don't have any answers as to how we're going to fix all this stuff, but I certainly think I want to be part of that conversation because it's, it's a really exciting and important yeah, of course, sometimes you break down and have a piece of pizza, but that does not undo years of veganism. I mean, people are so rough yeah, on themselves. Yeah. I think particularly in a world where people project this perfect version of themselves on through their social media and everyone consumes it and they look at it and they're like, well, I couldn't do that. You know, I couldn't eat that way three meals a day every day. So I may as well just not try. And it's like, do you realize what would happen if like just Americans cut out meat no. one day a week? <laughs> it's something like a hundred billion gallons of water a year and like 70 million gallons of gasoline. And it's crazy. It, yeah. And I don't, I don't want to get on the soapbox, but I will like, cause that's like where I live sometimes. But, um, I will say like for all those people who are like borderline vegan and they're like, I could never do it. I, I ate a popsicle for dinner. <laughs> you know, I just like <laughs> I had so much going on today. Like, there's plenty of junk food. You can still live as a vegan and eat trash and like enjoy yourself. But you know, I also want to recognize that not everybody can do that. It it is more expensive. And I I definitely have spent a lot of my life not having a lot of resources. And as an adult, like who has a job now um, and is in a place where I can can afford to eat vegan, I, I try and I try and make every step I can to live as ethically as possible. I know that's not really a thing at this point, but, you know, um, buying secondhand clothes, but also now that I have the income that will allow it, like I only shop at my local food co-op and I get a CSA and I plant a garden because these are all small things that I can do that I enjoy. I, I much rather, go to our small food co-op that has like nice soft lighting and cute little like displays, then go to Kroger. And although it costs more, it's worthwhile to me because it supports and is in line with my views. I mean, in a capitalist society, you can really vote with your dollars. So that's the goal. Yeah. And it's so important that we recognize and kind of like privilege check 
you know, um, ourselves here a little bit because, you know, telling someone to eat vegan is telling them you need to have access to grocery stores and you need to have income above the pot or poverty line and you need to work a job that gives you time to cook and you need to work a job that lets you go to Trader Joe's during the limited hours that Trader Joe's is open. Because, you know, I have definitely had varying income levels throughout my life and I have had varying levels of ability to be vegetarian and vegan. I mean, even if you just take like life in Bangkok, right? Like Bangkok's a huge metropolitan city. It's got 9 million people. So I can get these mind-bogglingly beautiful, organic smoothie bowls that look like rainbow dreams for 350 baht. Or I can go down to the corner and I can get fried chicken for 15 baht. Right? And we live in a neighborhood where the average income for like the people who live around us is 150 baht a day. So it's really complicated why people make the choices that they make around food. And I really like phrases like, like tend your own garden, right? Keep your own side of the street clean. Like tend your own garden, don't be an asshole, and go easy on yourself if you get drunk and eat a slice of pizza. Yeah, I mean, and and I'm certainly not an expert on any of this stuff, but I really do think like be forgiving yourself for those mistakes is the most important thing and just working to like do better and be better every day. You know, I'm I think we're all doing our best in really difficult circumstances and there are little things that I get to do. Like I am so thankful because I get to be vegan. Um and like you said, my our the culture of food in my family doesn't go back thousands of years, probably, uh, because we're um, in America. But at the same time, you know, my father was a trapper or or trapped and hunted his father, his father, you know, it it goes back and back and back and back. It was like kind of a traditional thing. And, you know, I'm, I am me and I don't do those things. And I'm one of the very few people in my small family who doesn't engage in that. And, sometimes it feels a little alienating, but at the same time, like, uh, I went home a while back and my dad just handed me this big, beautiful dead beaver. And that's, it's really sad that it's dead, but I took hundreds of photographs of it. And now I can represent that animal in a, in a way that is, is beautiful and, uh, incorporated into my work and have meaningful conversations around it and learn more about that creature because I've had that experience. So, you know, take what you have and use it. Can you speak to the role that animals play in your art as an expression of empathy? And also within that, I'd really be curious to hear your thoughts too on what is it about the reproduction of animals in art, you know, through drawing them, through interpreting them, that makes them have a different impact on the viewer than, say, just a photo of the animal does? Well, lots of people, you know, lots of people don't hike and don't live in places where they're ever going to get to just see a beaver in the wild. And, and because we're so inundated with photographs at this point, sometimes I think that they can just get brushed aside, which, I mean, there are brilliant photographers um, and brilliant wildlife photographers who are doing amazing work to highlight animal species. But I, I think that sometimes people see this and they're like, what a cute X, Y, Z, where if you spend time uh, recreating something as a drawing, not only do you get to um, manipulate it and make it a little bit more um, anthropomorphized and um, relatable maybe to a human, you also get to put a lot of time and energy into it. And when you draw or print or paint or do whatever in a representational way. And there's a high level of skill there. I think there's something in everybody's like kind of at the, at the base of their consciousness that, that sees that time and energy put into it and just automatically makes this connection. Like this must be important. If somebody would put however many hours into making this or, or get however much carpal tunnel from drawing it, there must be something that matters about this. And, um, it sparks really meaningful conversations. And that's really always the goal is just to get people talking because um, it's really easy to continue to ignore an injustice until you start talking about it. 
And then you either have to outright deny it or you have to engage with it. And, and I think that that's always my goal is to just ask people to engage with stuff. And it's really important that I do it in the right way, which is, is not accusatory. Sometimes I think I, I maybe play a little bit too much with that line. I'm, I'm staring at a piece in my studio right now that's a dead fox, a dead fox, and then letter press printed under it. It just says unmoved. And I think that might be a little in the face. Um, but for the most part, I try and, you know, pose a question and, and get people discussing these things. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's interesting because you're, you're making work about the way that we interact with animals, right? And and the way that it's like we uh, sort of consume something about them, like their their fur or their flesh or their labor. Well, it's everything. We consume animals entirely. Like, I mean, it's hard not to get emotional when you think about it because not only do we consume their fur, their flesh, their labor, but also their places. You know, we, we create these weird boxes where they're allowed to exist and and, and they're defined by things that don't necessarily make sense to animals like property lines. And, and we frustrated when they come into our space. There is this beautiful article called A Sense of Place by Amy Umble. And in it, uh, she talks about like the brook tra- trout near where she lives. Um, she's a spoon carver and, and makes brilliant, beautiful work. Um, I highly recommend her work. You know, she talks about animals being indicator species and like how she, she approaches this article from the standpoint of looking at a brook trout and it being an indicator species and, and talking about how they, whenever possible, make decisions in their life with the brook trout in mind. And I thought that, I just think that's such a beautiful way of thinking about it. You know, I'm, I'm going to purchase this item or this thing, but I want to do it with, you know, the, the heron in mind or, or XYZ, whatever your favorite animal is, the, the little red fox in mind. And do I really need this? Is this, is this decision going to come into conflict with its well-being? And that's just so important to not forget about the things around you because like I was saying, we are, we are consuming not only them and, their, re- and their, their bodies, but also their habitats and their places and, and really disrupting it. You don't you don't get to just remove that one piece of the ecosystem that you don't like. So, you know, I don't like mosquitoes. I want those ones gone. Things that you like eat mosquitoes, you know, and it's really important to to make your choices with the brook trout in mind, I guess is my rambling thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talking about these issues, which are, you know, clearly really close to you, really close to me, but you're doing it in a way where you're posing a question rather than being accusatory. And I think that that's really huge when it comes to approaching issues. Um, And what I mean by that is if, if you make something and the implicit voice behind it is like, here's what I think and you're bad, you're not going to get anywhere with anyone because that immediately puts up that wall of self-protection. Whereas if you can say, hey, I'm just asking you this question and I'm doing that through these really beautifully rendered animals, like these incredible line work, just this incredible draftsmanship. I I think it's this way of being a gentle voice asking a really hard, hard question, but in a little bit of a, with a little bit of a soft touch, I guess. Yeah. That is it. Because like, if you don't ever get to like, touch one of these animals or interact with one of these animals, this is a really interesting way to do it. And if I can make little subtle changes, you know, I always want to be faithful to the the animal and its representation, but if I can change the reflection on the eye just a little bit to be softer or, or up the contrast and the lighting to make it feel a little bit, I guess, um, more personal, like a one-on-one experience that, that can be that connection and that little spark. And, I, I don't think that that happens very often, but I, every once in a while I'll get a message from somebody who's like, hey, this this piece means the world to me. And that's really, I mean, what more could you ask for as somebody who's making things to make something that could, could touch somebody in a personal way? So with the time we have left, I do not want to miss out on 
giving you the opportunity to speak a little bit about the letterpress collection that you manage. Um, because letterpress is this interesting branch on the printmaking family tree, right? We all use specialized equipment, but letterpress has this whole other side where you've got these precious collections of fonts. Yeah, I'm, I'm so lucky. You know, I, I get to work at Indiana University and we have just an incredible collection. Um, we also have the Lilly Library, which is this beautiful books collection, and uh, the Wells Library, which has a, a portion of it that's all lovely, lovely book arts things. So it's, I'm kind of in a little like heaven <laughs> doing what I do here and, and I couldn't be happier um, but yeah, so I maintain the, the presses and the collection and I, I teach the letterpress and, um, right now I'm actually co-teaching a book arts course with a colleague, um, and printmaker, Tanya Targensen. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty special. Um, we have three SP 15 Vandercooks. We have a universal three Vandercook. Uh, we have a one Vandercook, uh, 325 G Vandercook and a Vandercook four, in my office, I have a little Kelsey press, um, another Vandercook, and there's a Washington press. Um, I just, I mean, it, there's so much stuff, <laughs> and um, I get to, I get to keep it all working, <laughs> which is very challenging, but um, really great. I've learned an incredible amount about how to repair these machines, and I'm very thankful for. Um, uh, the knowledge I have from working on other machines. <laughs> Could you speak to the process of incorporating letterpress into your artwork and why that's significant? Because, you know, you can clearly draw. So it's not like drawing the letter forms would be, um, you know, beyond your range of skill. So why go for letterpress? Why go through kind of all the the hassle in the to do, what is that adding to your practice? Well, it's it, for me, designing on a, on a screen has always felt like designing. Um, and, and obviously I love graphic design. Like there is, I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those people who has any sort of distinction between like, this is fine art and this is design. I just think if you don't incorporate fine art or, or a sense of art into your design, you're really just like, I don't know, making patterns on napkins or something. I don't know what those people do. But um, when I first approached letterpress, it felt like drawing because I was moving things around in this press bed and I was able to apply ink by hand and control every single step of it. And that was so important to me to really feel like I had this connection to it. I'm also not the kind of person who gets terribly invested. Like I, I couldn't rebuild a computer or a banner printer, but I can take apart a press and put it back together and, and being able to work on the little motors in them and just kind of all the, all the aspects of them is so important. Um, so I, I feel like I have a huge connection to this machine and that's really important to me. Also, it's just, it's fun. Yeah, no. And that definitely, we cannot underestimate the value in that. Like you need to be able to take joy and yeah, you, you should make. love what you're doing. I also think that that is incredibly important. And if you're, if you're not able to engage with and love what you're doing as an artist, like that means you're bored and it's time to make something new. Um, but letterpress specifically, I, and working with text and image, anyone who's a student who is, is doing that and is struggling or, or feels like they're hitting a roadblock. The first thing I would, I would say is take introduction to design and if your program has it, take typography. Like there are rules to this, you know, you n not hard and fast rules that you have to follow, but there are, there's a structure to putting type on a page and having it interact with an image that makes sense that people have figured out. And the lovely thing about being in the world of graphic design is, you know, it's often called communications design with the goal of communicating at its heart. And I mean, I'm making art with an, an intent to communicate to people my ideas or get people thinking and talking. And I, I start every single piece the same way I would start any larger design project, which is with thumbnails and research and writing and making sure I understand what I'm making. And that doesn't take it away from, it still comes so much from the heart it just means that it, I'm coming into it with a different level of knowledge that is, I guess, um, something that I've always brought to the design work that I do. 
Yeah, that's perfect. Um, that is probably exactly the kind of answer I was hoping for. Yeah. There are people who are really smart at your institution who will show you how to use type and image. And if somebody's saying it's not working, it's just because they got to learn about this. So listen to them and, and make something. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Well, I can't believe we're already at the hour mark here. And that went quick. <laughs> it went really, really quick. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I just feel like I could, could chat with you forever and we have so much to talk about and I'm so jealous hearing you talk about hiking with your partner and your dog. I mean, that's something that I really, really love doing in Seattle. Am I correct in understanding you just got a dog, by the way? Yes! (laughs) Congratulations! Yes, I know! She's, yeah, we're so done for She's just absolutely a perfect, perfect oh, angel. Sure yeah. yeah. I mean, all, all dogs are perfect, right? I mean, all dogs are perfect. Absolutely. I'm so happy to hear it. I, I was listening to an older episode of yours where you were talking about a dog, and I, I just was like, oh, this person needs another yeah. dog. <laughs> I do. I really do. Yeah. Can you please let people know where they can find you and see your art? And see your perfectly curated vegan meals that will give them guilt? (laughs) No, I don't ever post my food. So, (laughs) yeah, my lonely half-melted popsicle. Um, Yeah, I I have a website, um, alexanderlanderman.com. And then I have um, an Instagram, which is just alexanderlanderman. Um, I really appreciate when people reach out and, and... uh, chat with me whether you think something I said was silly or maybe you're somebody who wants to collaborate or a scientist or something and, and you want to want to talk animals I would I would love that and then I have a solo show coming up um, in New Zealand at Quirky Fox in October I think so um, you'll be able to if somebody's really interested in the work it'll be available through them in October so yeah excellent well yeah. we will put links to all of that in the show notes and Alexander, it has just been an absolute pleasure to connect and to talk about animals and prints and and being a part-time vegan, most of the time vegan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just, you know, want to get on your soapbox, but don't want to lose all your friends. And yeah, it's it's important, but... Yeah, humans are humans. Anyway, if uh, if you're ever in Bangkok or Thailand, um, yes, do please let 100%. us know. Yes, hundred If you're if you're ever in wherever I am, uh, please look me up. I would I'd love to spend more time with with both you and Sam. Yes. Oh, please, please, yeah. Like take us take us for a hike in the woods. Um, yeah, we we definitely miss that and would like that a lot. And I keep saying this, but it, it, you know, can't say it enough. Thailand has an amazing printmaking scene. Please come see it uh, when the walls are down. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Let me know if you ever need a drawing of your little soy dog. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we would love that. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's our show this week. Join me again next week when my guest will be Des McMahon from the Limerick Printmakers. Des, as an amazing storyteller, will have you spellbound telling the story of how Limerick Printmakers started, what it went through, and where it's going. You won't want to miss it. This episode, like all episodes, was written and produced by me, Miranda Metcalf, with editing by Timothy Pauschak and music by Joshua Weber. I'll see you next week.